Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have someone I have known and respected for years, Darren Chapman of Tiger Mountain Foundation, to talk about his experience using urban agriculture to stimulate community development. Darren is a community pro-activist who has committed his life to helping people. He is the founder and CEO of Tiger Mountain Foundation and has implemented empowerment initiatives to uplift communities and eliminate blight. Tiger Mountain's initiatives include community gardens and landscape developing, audio, visual, and art performance, community service and volunteerism. The gardens promote healthy living by growing lush gardens and feeding the community. Tiger Mountain's asset-based community development model was developed with the thought of urban renewal and restoration of communities. Participants who stay engaged are motivated to keep positive and will develop their individual very important assets. Darren's motto is to change one mind and attitude at a time, encouraging all who have been touched to pay it forward, which will undoubtedly make the immediate community and the world a better place to live. Darren currently resides and works in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Welcome to the show today, Darren. Well, thank you, Greg. I surely appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So excited. You know, we've known each other for a while, and I love the work you do, so I'm looking forward to hearing about it. So I shared a Well, thank you. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, sure, Greg. I, I would have to say um, that that old cliche, the, the path of least resistance is not what I did. I actually <laughs> took the, the unfortunate path of uh, the most resistance. Oh, wow. And basically, uh, as, as I was growing up uh, in, in South Central Los Angeles, uh, in, in a really tough neighborhood as far as there, there weren't a whole lot of uh, opportunity when it come to, comes to making really good choices. Right. We, we had liquor stores, uh, a lot of urban sprawl around us. Uh, it was the advent of gangs. And so basically most of the decisions that I made were formulated around uh, people who were very involved with making very unhealthy decisions. Mm-hmm. And so uh, starting from that uh, standpoint, uh, always uh, made my hurdle quite a bit higher mm-hmm. as far as trying to achieve and, and accomplish things in life. And, and that was the beginning of the pathway. Um, you know, just, just a quick from there to here, that, that progressed into, unfortunately, me being behind bars uh, at least eight times in my life. When I wow. say behind bars, incarcerated, uh-huh. uh, those institutions of unhigher learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so that's basically uh, some of the things that were in my pathway as I started. Uh, and, you know, I, I like I said, a quick from there to here, I, 
uh, went to school, Arizona State University, went to college, did always relatively well in school, as other people maybe go to spring break in Florida. I was going back to South Central Los Angeles uh-huh. and or South Phoenix, where my mother eventually moved to, and pretty much encountering most of those same things that I saw as a very young kid, which is most of the gangs, most of the really hardcore illicit drugs, and uh-huh. uh, most of the uh, other things that surrounded that, which were the vacant fields and the other disparity, the environmental issues that we deal with, the um, vacant lots, and, mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, unfortunate inopportunity that happens with a lot of us young kids. We don't see necessarily myself transferring into mom's business or dad's business. Right. You know, you just kind of see like, once again, a a higher hurdle to climb. Mm -hmm. And so I had to uh, start thinking in terms of what the heck am I going to actually do about my life if I'm going to get back on the right track? Yeah. So at at some point you had an aha moment because I know who you are these days. Mm -hmm. uh, And Mm -hmm. at some point you had an aha moment that went from uh, this prison life, behind bars life, to making a difference in the world. Tell us about that. Yeah. So on my 25th birthday, the the person that I loved the most, Greg, my my grandfather was incredible. He was a Negro League baseball player, quite quite the fantastic Negro League baseball player with the Austin Black Bears. And Uh um, he was about 25 years old when he met my grandmother, who was actually a sharecropper. Uh, We're talking 1940s Texas. Wow, uh, and, and they were they were incredible urban farmers. Mm-hmm. They they moved to Los Angeles in 1945, and they created a little area of Los Angeles. They created an incredible way to get people engaged in the neighborhood, and that was they had a community garden in our backyard. We had peach trees, plums, avocados, wow. that type of really cool thing. So so a beautiful thing happened. Uh, with my grandfather. I saw that as a young kid. We would go rabbit hunting. We had typically nine to maybe 15 greyhounds at a time. And so everything was done so natural and so much from the land. Uh, The food was from the land. The conversations were very heartfelt uh, and very warm in open Uh spaces. And so in 1990, uh, my my grandfather, uh, as I was behind bars and on my 25th birthday, very, very quick story that I, I, I hope your listeners will love. On my 25th birthday, I, I literally would pray as a young guy. I remember the teacher saying that your average lifespan as a young black man growing up in this community is 25 years old. Wow. Right? So when I was 13 years old, I prayed, got down, as my grandmother taught me, the Lord's Prayer. Uh-huh. Uh, got down on bended knee and asked to live to be 26. Well, well on my... 20, actually, I went back to the negotiation table uh-huh. the next day and, and asked the big man upstairs, listen, 26 is being pretty greedy. That's how tough our neighborhood was. Wow. I'll take 25. But on my 25th birthday, right, as I sat in a maximum security cell, uh-huh. my, my grandfather passed away. Hmm. He passed away on my 25th birthday. Now, this was the man that I most idolized in life. Yeah. Loved the way that he got along with people, Greg. Loved everything about that man, man. He was just so perfect in an imperfect world. I mean, uh-huh. how does a guy provide food for his family, move them to 1945 Los Angeles, own a home? Uh, he was just everything. And then have kids who went out into the world and tried to aspire to do well. And he was the man. He passed on my 25th birthday as I sat in the maximum security jail cell. And that just crushed me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that just I can get literally that. hit home yeah. to where I was in my life. And, and that was my aha moment. That, that kind of let me know yeah. that, man, once you get out of this, this, this cage, it's time for you to actually get out there and make something work, man. Do something with your life. And yeah. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to tell the story because oh my uh, gosh. I, I love that man uh-huh. and I love what I do. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. So yes, m- make the jump then for me from you're 25 years old to, uh, you know, however old you are now and you're running a garden 
landscaping development, community development program here in Phoenix to to touch at risk youth. Mm -hmm. So t how'd that happen? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, I, I, I once again, like I said, I always did relatively well in school. So mm -hmm. it, it was just a matter of maybe having that aha moment, t taking that aha moment with some other, I feel very innovative and creative ways, Greg, to be proactive in an urban setting. So therefore, some of the people that I always wanted to, you know, I always had these dreams as a kid, Greg, where, uh -huh. you know, the guy next door and the guy next door to him and some, some of the cats from across the street, man, we all just get together and then somehow have this incredible band like the Jackson Five, or <laughs> I'd be playing shortstop for yep. the Dodgers and my, my buddy be playing right field. I mean, yeah. that's what I always wanted to do. So, so what happened was, is during that aha moment, I, I literally, one of my, my, my goals was to get back into what I call legitimate streams of income. Uh -huh. uh, it made more sense, obviously, than what was getting me behind those bars. Right. So uh, I looked for different ways to do that. So we had uh, some location uh, scouting and management and uh, dormant host catering craft services for the Hollywood area. Uh, matter of fact, it was uh, the third highest murder capital block in the nation. Wow. But, but not only to look for those legitimate streams of income, but, but even put more innovation behind it, such as making it a multi-ethnic intergenerational mm. mentoring concept, mm -hmm. uh, something that I never at that time didn't know that it would even transition into the nonprofit. But the idea was basically to engage very smart, very hungry people who wanted to be empowered as opposed to being in another food stamp program. Mm -hmm. This would be about true community development and it could always be very interactive so therefore you can address some of the issues with individuals because you're always around them mm -hmm. so you always not only have the resources but it wouldn't be so basic as you coming to me saying here's my problem and then I say this is the way we're going to resolve it right. this is basically you getting involved you bringing some some of your creativity to the table uh -huh. and then us putting something together uh, that empowers our community, changes the landscape, literally changes that vacant field into a component that actually works for people coming into that spectrum, that, mm -hmm. that community garden is uh, what we call the Trojan horse. It's literally there. <laughs> and then we come out with all these incredible oh, that's beautiful. different, absolutely, man, different re resources and, and, um, different ways to not only have a garden, but to bring that produce up to scale, mm -hmm. uh, take a commercial uh, landscape contract, transition youth, adults from those contracts and, and, and that development into other jobs mm -hmm. or literally doing better for their family. So it just was a, a unique opportunity to bring transformation and transition back into the urban setting, back into our community. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. And somehow you got to Phoenix. Somehow I got to Phoenix. My mother, I, I actually thought we were on our way to Beverly Hills, the way my mother described it. <laughs> uh, Hold on, I just, got, I just got a picture of Beverly Hillbillies at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my grandparents, I just told you, were the original Beverly Hill Billies because mm -hmm. we had greyhounds and uh, mm. produce growing in the backyard. As a matter of fact, nice. uh, uh, the advent of gang, that, that was actually called Fruit Town. They became Fruit Town Bloods, but the actual community was called Fruit Town because people brought their kumquat, loquat seeds. I mean, uh -huh. I, I just remember walking down the steps and there were, uh, it, was, it was like a veritable garden of Eden full nice. of produce. There was plums to my left, peaches to my right, avocados just in front of me, and then a beautiful, <laughs> bountiful garden always, yeah. seasonal. And they, and they did it raw, man. I mean, they, they, they traded seeds. They took seeds out of other melons, mm -hmm. and that, that was basically a seed library, per se. Yeah. Uh, kept those seeds for the next season, man. It was just a really cool way to learn about it. But, uh, Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so so L.A. to Phoenix. So like I said, I, I was, I, man, I started being the Beverly Hillbillies over there, started thinking so much about it, got the gosh darn question. So, so this is 
what happened. My mother, we, so her, her three daughters or one of uh, my younger sisters had mm-hmm. asthma. Mm-hmm. And the thing was in the 1970s yep. is, man, go to Phoenix, Phoenix. Arizona. The yep. air is clear. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and that clear air would be better for her asthma. So mm-hmm. my mom got the girls together. I was living with my grandparents and they moved to Phoenix and she asked if I would be interested. And I was a young kid. I didn't know too much about being interested in anything. Change seemed good because as a young guy, I was already smoking, drinking, and yeah. picked up guns. And this was probably by the age of seven, eight years old. Wow. Uh, so I literally, as a young man, was thinking I kind of need a change of lifestyle, change mm-hmm. of pace. Mm-hmm. And so when my mother went back to Phoenix one time, I hopped in the car and went <laughs> back to Phoenix and uh, talking about out of the frying pan and into the, the fire. fire. No I kidding. Mean, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I went from 77 degrees during the summer to 120. 115. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so literally and figuratively, because she moved from South Central LA to South Phoenix, mm. the, the only difference is less buildings. Mm-hmm. Maybe a few less gains, but the yeah. same type of scenario. Yeah. So that's how I wound up in Phoenix. My mother thought, uh, like most parents, man, this will be a great opportunity to not only take care of one of my kids, but maybe get a new start yeah. and own a home and have some beautiful things in my life that I you know, always wanted. Yeah. And so it was her dream, and then it actually became my dream to come to Phoenix and maybe do something very different than what I was doing in Los Angeles. Well, and it sounds like you did because you formed something called the Tiger Mountain Foundation. So tell us about mm. that, would you? Yeah. So so the Tiger Mountain Foundation was a spinoff from what we call DC Network Productions. Earlier I had talked about those legitimate streams of income. Yep. We were looking for in the... Uh, So this was about 2005 through 2007. We really started cooking with fire in 2007 as far as really getting some work done in the community. What we wanted to do is in in the shadow of the housing market falling to pieces and some of those legitimate streams of income actually waning, disappearing, Uh we, we literally looked for another angle to uh, not only uh, keep some of the different people that came through our doors over the previous years, five, 10 years of Mm -hmm. DC Network, uh, but to also look for a way to push them back forward. And produce was a way that we could actually just start, uh, for one, kind of thinking about different ideas and how we're gonna take those different ideas and, and, and maybe create more better business. So mm-hmm. as we started growing a little small garden, we started talking about maybe we could all get involved in real estate together. Of course, the real estate market had, had you know, overturned and, yeah. and, and was, wasn't in a good shape in 2006, 2007. So, so what we did is we grew that little garden to start talking about our issues. And a funny thing happened. People would start coming by and actually asking if they could purchase some of the produce. Oh my gosh. Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah, so we threw that little garden there and, and we got some people together, Greg, and it was very cool. I mean, you know, people would, would so if we had a, uh, a monthly garden meeting, now we do it every second and fourth Saturday, uh-huh. and this has actually been since 2007. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very successful. I, I don't. I'm, I'm positive there's nothing like it in the United States of America for mm-hmm. sure. Uh-huh. I mean, we've literally had, you know, on average maybe 120 to, to maybe even as many as 500 people wow. on a Saturday. Yeah, literally working together. Uh, that multi-ethnic intergenerational yeah. mentoring yeah. went to a whole other level, uh, which we which was somewhat intentional, um, but but also somewhat incredible and uh, um, and, and and epic. It was very yeah. life changing and very <laughs> huge for you know people to kind of say, "Wow, man, this is us!" And people are coming to our neighborhood to watch how we grow. I mean, this is something that was ingrained in us through our ancestors over the last 100, 150, 200 years. Yeah. And now we're doing it as the proprietors of the dream. 
Uh, so, so that's Tiger Mountain Foundation. It literally started with a small backyard community garden and trying to get people together, the Latinos in the community, the, the blacks in the community, mm-hmm. the Caucasians uh, in the community, the educators, potentially, and, and once again, this was very intentional, intentional, but hopefully some different businesses to kind of come and see what right. we do, and then maybe we could all figure out an angle to uh, make it uh, somewhat helpful to the community. Yeah. So these days, Tiger Mountain Foundation, you're growing food, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we have uh, three different gardens mm-hmm. where we grow. Um, we, we have a 1.5 acre, a 5-acre, uh, a 18-acre, wow. and a, uh, another 5-acre uh, separate collaborative that we do with a uh, partner. Uh-huh. Wow, and what, mm-hmm. are you, what are you growing, and what are you doing with the food? Well, so, so we're growing a little bit of everything. Uh-huh. Uh, sometimes a restaurant may ask for something very specific and mm-hmm. say, hey, if you grow okra in these four acres, we'll take X amount of dollars of okra. Uh, out of those acres and into our restaurant. So, mm-hmm. so we sometimes do a very specialty crop for uh, some people because as we decided to move forward with this, we had to have a very sound business concept. And so we also grow uh, for farmer's markets as well. So we have a variety of produce that are 1.5 acres. Uh, typically on all the properties, we'll also do an acre or two of variety of different squash, melons at oh, this yes. time of year, yep. okra. Uh-huh. Uh, Swiss chard grows in Arizona, period. Right. And yeah, yeah. So so we are, we're always, uh, our onions uh, were unbelievable this last onion season and tomatoes even though it's been very very hot yeah. uh, our tomatoes are still doing very well so nice and who tell us about the people that are actually doing the growing the people who are doing the growing is what i what once again earlier in this conversation i i always dreamed that maybe the guy next door uh-huh. uh, could actually maybe play with me on the dodgers or yeah. you know once again be be part of that big band well, well this is part of that big band man we we are the <laughs> ultimate rock stars of community urban urban community gardening yeah uh which we also call agriscaping as well we're doing some great stuff with uh folks in the community uh like mr justin ronner as well currently. oh yeah yeah and it, it just made perfect sense because we have a landscaping we have a landscaping facet and also a community garden facet uh, to, to combine that together is actually what herbis, uh, agriscaping is all about. Uh-huh. The people who are growing in these gardens, Greg, are just like myself. They, they were people who may have grown up in, the, uh, in that school of hard knocks, maybe took that path of most resistance, <laughs> which basically, unfortunately, could have led them into um, incarceration or uh, for some of our youth, unfortunately into high risk dilemma uh as they come up with the Mm -hmm. uh you know maybe fatherless family or the mother really struggling to make ends meet and and then you combine all of that with um still wanting to go to the dance and still wanting to be the guy that could take the girl out to dinner you you need to you needed to generate dollars and unfortunately wait the means for doing some of these things, the ways and means for doing some of these things were um, counterproductive to you being okay Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, mentally and and spiritually in your community. So these are most of those types of people that are gardening with Tiger Mountain Foundation. It starts, our youngest gardener is four years old. Nice. Uh, We have two four years old. Yeah, one young lady uh, reminds me every time that she's actually four and a half. (laughs) Uh, So I got to give her those six months. I I don't, I back off. She's a whippersnapper already. So Mm -hmm. I kind of back off and give her that half year. Um, and then we also have uh, our oldest uh, gardener, which is uh, 91 wow. years old. Yeah, yeah, Miss Winifred uh, Wee Wee Belcher. She's doing a fantastic job of gardening and, and working at Tiger Mountain. Matter of fact, she's been with us since 2008. Wow. So she's yeah, she's grown from a uh, teeny bopper senior into a full fledged <laughs> senior. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, she was probably about 82, 83 years old when she started with us. Yeah, she's doing a fantastic job. But but even more than that, we have uh, that intergenerational mix. Uh, We got two college graduates who are doing a fantastic job in management at Tiger Mountain. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you probably were the teacher uh, for Tommy Verderam or Thomas oh, yeah. Verderam. Mm-hmm. Yep, doing a fantastic job at Tiger Mountain Foundation. And cool. Ryan Moores, who was uh, with the uh, William P. Carey School of Business as yep. well. I just saw um, him yesterday. It, it, oh, did you? Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah so, so it's just super diverse these days. And this is what we love about Tiger Mountain. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, as I talked to you uh, earlier, or spoke with you earlier, we talked about some of the things that may not have gone well. Uh, it, that That's going to actually touch on some of the things that I thought we did really, really well. But one thing that we didn't do tremendously well, uh, which is actually become very inclusive of our and very mindful of how we were going to build the admin capacity of a nonprofit mm-hmm. organization trying to be a stronger business. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we had people coming in from every community, Maryville, Arcadia, uh, coming in from juvenile detention, coming in from the prisons, and wow. it was overload. It was overwhelming, mm-hmm. and we just grew and grew and grew. And we were at 12 farmers markets at one time with four community gardens. And wow. man, people were like, wow, man. Yeah, they, they were like, these guys are the bell of the ball. Th- this is exactly what we're talking about with empowerment. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately for, for us, though, what we didn't recognize and I didn't recognize as a uh, person who was trying to formulate a different business strata. I've always known how to do well in business, right. but... but I probably made a couple of million dollars before I had ever heard of a W-2 or a W-9. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so I had a lot, uh, quite a bit to learn. learn. And yeah. so, you know, but, but uh, yeah, those, are, but, but what, once again, though, the, the heart of Tiger Mountain Foundation was, was literally the people of the local community. That's what started this thing rolling in such a mm-hmm. tremendous direction. And then, once again, we had to learn the hard way that, man, there's something that we're missing here. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll, we'll hopefully touch on that a little bit later. That's Yeah, that's how we grow, isn't it? So mm-hmm. one of your questions that you gave me is, what is your end game strategy? I want to know that. That's a, that's a curious mm. question. Ah, my end game strategy. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our end game strategy at Tiger Mountain Foundation has, has actually, quite frankly, um, been questioned by some people who are very close to Tiger Mountain Foundation. Uh-huh. The, 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 the end game strategy. I, I once heard a guy in a speaking engagement, and I was so impressed. And, and one of the things that that guy said is, always dare to be epic. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hey, I Greg. know what's coming here. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my good friend, guy by the name of Greg Peterson. Wow. You may have heard of him. <laughs> yeah, he's actually interviewing me. I'm, love I'm blushing. Yeah, lo- love that gentleman. Lo- love mm. that. I, I mean, some things people say, and I was there just like the rest of the crowd to kind of listen to yeah. what this guy had to say. I, I was learning quite a bit about different aspects of, of, of gardening. I mean, uh-huh. you know, what, what's uh, integrated pest management? Uh, mm-hmm. how, how do you uh, have cost-efficient water flow? Um, and, and that's why I was there. Mm-hmm. But, but that said it all. Mm-hmm. Dare to be epic. Mm-hmm. And, and most of these guys that, that literally looked at Tiger Mountain Foundation have not necessarily dared to be epic. Through, through all the trials and tribulation of their life, and, and maybe being behind bars, we, we've had guys do as many as 30 years wow. of incarceration. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to dare to be epic. You're, you're almost walking on eggshells when you get out in a position like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very successful folks, uh, mind you, who are doing relatively well. But the end game strategy of Tiger Mom Foundation is to have an impact on someone that is at that exact end of the extreme, the exact mm-hmm. end of that spectrum. Beautiful. And that is that person who, who has almost very little hope. I don't want to say no hope, 
or else he wouldn't have walked through our doors hoping that something could happen in his life yeah. that could be transitional, uh, that could be transformational. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then that, that four-year-old that I spoke of earlier who actually performs on our community garden stage oh, yeah. with other very accomplished spoken word artists or mm-hmm. a kid who can play a trumpet like you wouldn't believe. He's literally a mm-hmm. diamond in the rough, probably on his way to maybe playing with an orchestra. I mean, yeah. our, our kids have such very interests. Our adults have such uh, incredible dreams. Uh, and, and we have to make sure that what we through what we call our personal strategy roadmap, we're able to provide an in-game strategy for each individual that, that somewhat varies because uh-huh. of the asset-based community development model that we have. Right. That might mean that someone is that you know has a third grade education might be 50 years old uh-huh. uh, but our in-game strategy really speaks to how we can impact each individual that walks through our doors to the best of our ability and the best of their ability that uh, um, is is something that we do by being a stronger business model and an open business model that mm-hmm. literally invites uh, some of these young kids that are doing work from the colleges. Uh, we have oh, a yeah. COO who actually worked in the education system but brings incredible uh, evaluative measure to uh, how we are impacting folks in the community, how we are utilizing our mission towards a better business. Are, are we staying within that mission? Mm-hmm. Um, is, is it mission drift or is it absolute um, uh, impact within our mission? Yeah. Fa- fantastic, gentlemen. I mean, these are different types of people. And so our in-game strategy uh, actually is here now. Uh, we, we will continue Beautiful. to grow that in Yes, sir, man. I mean, we, we're literally at a point. Greg, I've never been so excited about this hmm. nonprofit organization. Oh, very good. Yeah, th- th- this is what we wanted to accomplish, and yeah. we now are saying, okay, great. Now, how do we keep this very consistent while still growing in, in loving spoonfuls? Uh, we, we, we need to be careful because we don't have a bank loan. This is Tiger Mountain Foundation actually as we move forward, we're looking uh-huh. for better strategies to bring the stimulus to grow it to the next level. So that's, that's, that's been an increment as opposed to, once Perfect. again, you know, a, yeah. a bank loan. It, it's, it's a social venture. Uh, yeah. There's been, you know, the Vitalist Health Foundations and nice. Tap AZ and yep. Social Venture Partners, State Farm. i uh, got to give them a quick shout out. Those are some of the people who have really knocked on our door and said, hey, man, we love what you guys are doing in the community. We'd be interested in assisting in this way. While all of that is happening, if none of that happened, there's commercial residential landscaping contracts with Mm -hmm. arborists and horticulturalists and master gardeners who are some of the different consultants that we bring in so that these guys could either go into an entrepreneurial venture or into a company that can pay them better than the Mm -hmm. Tiger Mountain Foundation. The end game strategy is here and we will expound on that by doing some other things with the city of Phoenix. Um, Housing and urban development is uh, people that we've spoken to recently. We have some other things going on with Arizona Mm -hmm. at works, uh, which is used to be the old Phoenix workforce connection. Uh, we just won our first CDBG grant. Oh, with the city congratulations! Of as well, yeah, congratulations. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much. I mean, th- this is what happens when maybe do one guy epic, doesn't huh? have. To, huh? You go out and do something epic. Yay, man! Dare to be epic, my friend. <laughs> Dare to be epic. Th- this is this is great. Uh, in our community. I mean, I never thought I'd be on three of the mayor's boards after some of the things that have happened in my life. No kidding. And the mayor says, you know what, I actually think you're a really good example of sustainability. So I was part of this sustainability advisory committee. And then he said, wait a minute, man, now this is really good leadership. So now I'm part of his African-American strategic leadership. And then he said, you know what, you guys received an accommodation by the Phoenix Police Department. Let's put you on that advisory board, too. So now you can be a sounding board for people right there in the nucleus and the heart of the work and uh, bring it back. And maybe we can forge some better relations between law enforcement and what's happening on the street. Maybe that's a cultural competency that 
needs to happen. So love. Yeah. Love, love, I mean, the end game this. strategy is here. So congratulations. Yeah. So thank you, man. Yeah, Appreciate absolutely, you. man. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about a time you failed, how you overcame mm-hmm. that failure and what you might have learned from it? Yeah. Uh, can can I give you a, um, a kind of a double sided example here? Sure. Because one led to the other. So so the, the 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 biggest failure, Greg, that that I would love for your listeners uh, to hear is the fact that I, I wanted to always have something, be something, aspire to have more in life. Uh-huh. When, when I actually saw. Uh, all of the different things that could be potential flaws in myself and flaws in other people, I chose a path that said, you know what, I'm going to go live up in the Santa Monica Mountains for two, three years. And and so I uh, went up Latuna Canyon and lived up in that those mountains and uh, next to a guy they called Frogman. I think they've actually cleaned that area out. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was an old Vietnam vet and uh, here I was, a young dude, just just disillusioned about who I was. I, I needed some more maturation, and um, I, I think actually uh, stepping away may have given me some growth. But I would also mm-hmm. consider that to be stepping away from maybe a responsibility that I just wasn't sure that I could take on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I would love for people to understand that that in essence, is actually something in life that you can go through, you can justify it as, as, as a maturation process, mm-hmm. but it can also be justified as you stepping away from a responsibility and, and maybe understanding what your responsibility and your niche is and trying to hone your life without stepping 100% away from society oh, yeah. uh, could have been a better i see how that would have been more beneficial than yeah you know what i did now now the other side of that coin is mm-hmm. is as i learned uh you still in in your beautiful imperfection you're i always tell people i am the epitome a um perfectly imperfect imperfect human being yeah so so therefore even though i overcame that aspect of my life and jumped back into the mainstream, bam, man, I ran into another pitfall. I just didn't know about tax laws. I didn't know about Mm. that type of thing. I still had some learning to do. Mm -hmm. And and man, did I have to learn the hard way. I, 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 you know, ran into, um, and and I'm I'm open about this type of stuff, man. I ran into a bankruptcy and ran into some other things that I didn't even see coming. I never heard of a W-2 or a W-9 or anything like that. I just wanted that legitimate stream of income to work and then someone knocked on my door and actually the IRS wasn't even jerks about it. They they tried to show me the pitfalls of just doing business the way that I was doing business. Uh So I learned from that. I I saw I I heard other people may have jumped off of bridges so because I aren't I I own property and some of those properties were in hard money loans. I was just going for it, man. I was doing it and I was living the American dream. And, and man, poof, literally <laughs> that was gone. Yeah. So, so now I've had to learn how to conduct business in, in a different, uh, uh, I use that word strata, but, but how to conduct business uh, more appropriately towards wh- whatever the process might be. Right. You see, oh, so yeah. as a nonprofit organization, I literally had to learn again. I, I, so I started doing that and started taking care of the taxes and, you know, documenting the people. And then I still needed to learn about how to grow it and, and yeah. make sure that I had the uh, proper uh, professional or uh, person in place that could actually take care of other a- take care of other aspects as it grew. So that was the admin capacity bill. So I had to learn that. And, and I would have to say that I grew business once again to a really great level while learning, oh, my God, <laughs> I, I, need, I need an accountant, and I yeah. need someone who's going to take care of that piece and dot the I's and cross the T's. Yeah. Uh, I thought I could actually be that person, so I learned QuickBooks. I learned fundraising, grant writing. I, I learned seven different things that I probably didn't know before, and all that did was give me uh, seven different jobs. Right, a bigger headache. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah a bigger headache. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep, I yep, understand exactly. that. Exactly. So, so, so I, I, I really got kicked 
squarely uh, keeping a PG-13 in the rear uh-huh. um, on, on trying to figure out how to become um, a better business person. And, and oh, those yeah. were, yeah, so I, I, you know, that that first piece was trying to learn how to mature and become a stronger Darren. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was so important before diving into any of this type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and then that happened. Thank goodness, man. I'm, I'm so glad that I'm here. And then the second part was, wow, so you become a stronger, more perfectly imperfect human being. Uh-huh. Oops. <laughs> Which means that we're going to have some more pitfalls, some more valleys in our life. And that, unfortunately, for as long as we live it, uh, could be an ongoing process that I've discovered. And uh, so, Let's... you know, put your best foot, foot forward. Yeah. Absolutely dare to be epic. And then <laughs> with that, it is going to be some uh, failure, unfortunately. Pitfalls. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Hmm. My biggest success. My biggest success would probably be the fact that my, I'd say in 2002, I was going to say about maybe 14 years or so ago, uh-huh. I, I had a lady fall in love with me. Uh, my, mm. my beautiful wife basically not, not only fell in love with me, she really trusted the fact that, that maybe as a man I could assist her in some other facets of her life. Uh-huh. And, you know, I showed her all the cash I had in the shoe. And uh, she thought that that was pretty dang impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. As impressive as that will take you, I'm sure, yeah. uh, that accounting process, as we found out, doesn't work very well. But not not only did I step up as a person who uh, I think matured, but, but mm-hmm. I was really able to uh, impact her life. Uh, she, she fell in love with me and, and now we have some really cool things, including raising her daughter and, and our granddaughter. Nice. Uh, we did that, I think really well. Uh, our daughter is doing well as a nurse. Uh-huh. Uh, my wife uh, still does some nursing and also works with the nonprofit, which is on more solid footing. We're only uh-huh. as good as our last day uh, with all that, that beautiful epic uh, thought process Mm -hmm. Um, and and so that's one of the things that I am so most proud of is the fact that I've been able to not only mature but actually impact the lives of others when I hear kids say hey man uh, happy Father's Day look man I know you're not my biological but things Uh have happened in my life man for the good and the bad but you've been through Mm. that with me you went Mm -hmm. through it with me and and that's why i would love to say happy father's day to you because that is not something that i did very often you know i love my biological dad and you know my stepfather uh we've had our issues but i just didn't do that man because i just didn't have that person next to me yeah. but for those kids and, and some of these adults to feel like I'm actually impacting their lives and as a result it surprises me actually sometimes Greg <laughs> I mean how much people really care that you can be of assistance and yeah. really respect that fact Isn't that nice I, I love that man that, yeah. that's the greatest I, I once again, the end game strategy has arrived, and, and, and I have arrived with it. Uh, to be part of that end game. Now, now, keep in mind, our, our end game strategy mm-hmm. is still, you know, beyond my lifetime. Now, now that we that literally hit the ball very solidly, yep. and, and we're in, it's in the gap, and the outfielder is bobbling, and man, we're rounding <laughs> second base. Man, I, I'm keeping very mindful that, you know, th- this is a marathon. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we really, if, if, if now we're building other young men, uh, some of them I mentioned earlier in this conversation, yep. that can actually, and they're 20 years my junior, and actually even 30 years my junior. Right. I never thought I'd be saying that. <laughs> they're, they're 30 years my junior, and they're yeah. affecting other young men the same way. Yeah. That, my friend, is what I'm most proud of. <laughs> nice. So, what drives you? Well, I typically um, am driven by socio uh, dilemma, socio economic factor. I say socio economics because 
you know, when I when I when I do the type of work that I do, I, I kind of look at the total picture, and I realize that if I didn't uh, dare to to actually make this thing a mega hit, you know, I, uh-huh. I called us uh, earlier the urban uh, rock and roll stars of the uh, urban community mm-hmm. garden set M- might be, you know, I, you you might be one of them, your gosh darn self, Greg, but that that's what actually drives me is, is being a person who actually can now affect the market in mm-hmm. this community mm-hmm. and I'm doing that with people who typically would not be engaged in oh, some of so this true. type of fair yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so including myself I yeah. mean I, I had a choice I right. had a choice and, and, and now I'm here and, and, and I'm actually affecting how different people are able to move very consciously towards a better lifestyle. Yeah. This is why we got into Tiger Mountain Foundation. How do we change our present? How do we change our predicament? How, how do we be something other than just uh, um, uh, someone who's receiving a, a, a program, uh-huh. government cheese, food stamps? How, how do we do that? I mean, should we dare? even aspire to do that? And what if we were receiving some of that assistance? Shouldn't we still aspire to be something other than someone waiting for that to happen? Mm -hmm. We we could still change overall what's happening in our environment. Uh, Why why have food stamps when, uh, and, and, and X amount of dollars when, you know, you have almost all liquor stores and, and drug choices, but but no other quality of lifestyle choices. I mean, yeah. I had never been to a symphony or even I dreamed about going to Hawaii. But but not only have I done that stuff, I'm I'm listening to some of our other participants nice. who have traveled the United States of America to see uh-huh. family, to do other different things. Man, that's exactly uh, hmm. one, one of the best things, man, that I could ever hang my hat on. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? The one final piece of advice that I would have for your listeners would be basically kind of going back to uh, some of those trials and tribulations. I, I, mm-hmm. I think that it's super important for people to understand that if, if, if you are, like myself, that, that incredible epitome of perfectly imperfect, imperfect. right? Which yeah. I think we pretty much mostly all are. Mm-hmm. And the ones who aren't, well, uh, my goodness, congratulations. You you are part of maybe a 0.0001 percentile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that w- which probably would just be mostly you. Um, so, so with that being said, I, I think it's just super important to stay grounded a very even killed and level headed never ever forget not only where you came from but where you want to go yeah. Yeah. and once again my beautiful friend and I love you putting this in my brain and I use it all the time with <laughs> our youth and our adults and seniors mm-hmm. and always dare to be epic mm. wow well thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today Darren it's been a treat chatting with you well thank you thank you greg i look forward to it man to all your listeners man greg peterson is my man i love him <laughs> and uh th- thank you to your staff for uh, allowing us to uh, uh give our message out to your Abs- listeners absolutely Appreciate you. so how can our listeners get a hold of you and get involved with tiger mountain foundation excellent question tiger mountain foundation is at www.tigermountainfoundation.org you can follow us on Facebook. We have gardens called Spaces of Opportunity, Garden of Tomorrow. You can actually mm. go to those sites and see some of the great work that we're doing with uh, some of our collaborative partners, Unlimited Potential, uh, Orchard Community Learning Center. Yeah, check us out on that www.tigermountainfoundation.org and come to one of our garden events and and learn about what we do in the community. Perfect. Thank you. That's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. 
Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text MEMBERSHIP to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.